Okay, well, I hope, hope you're all seeing this and I hope you're all getting me loud and clear. So the title of uh, my talk today is Petroleum Geoscience and the New Energy Reality. And I want to um, acknowledge right away uh, the major help I've had in this talk uh, from Edith Wilson, who has a consultancy called The Rock Whisperer. Um, some of the slides later on, on the role of geoscientists in the energy transition are, um, are provided by Edith, uh, just in case I forget to acknowledge them at the time. Um, so this is an introductory talk to a what is going to be a series of talks that constitute the conference that was originally going to be held in a room and is now being held virtually. I realize there's a lot of different disciplines in the, um, in the room today, in the virtual room. Um, and uh, if I touch on your discipline, I seem to be a little bit glib. Remember what this talk is, it's a scene setting talk. Um, but I hope in any case, that there'll be something for everybody in here. Now, okay, I'm a geoscientist, um, but uh, at the same time, I, um, um, uh, uh, as I say, I'm touching on several other disciplines, and the first one I want to actually um, uh, do is to take a bit of a risk and dip into um, a little bit of pop psychology. Now, I see there's at least one educational psychologist in the audience today, so um, uh, so maybe I'm on really shaky ground here, but in any case, flicking through the internet the other day, I was reminded of this term, cognitive dissonance. Um, the mental conflict that occurs when a person's behaviors and beliefs do not align. It may also happen when a person holds two beliefs that contradict one another. So you can hold two contradictory beliefs at the same time. That strikes me as where the petroleum industry is right now. Um, one of you, by the way, needs to, everybody needs to mute. I'm getting some background sound here. Um, so please mute if you haven't already. Um, so look at these two statements here from the uh, UK authorities. The UK needs to discover more oil and gas to maintain indigenous supply. But on the other hand, they believe that the UK should be carbon neutral by 2050. Now, it doesn't actually take a genius to see that these two statements are in complete conflict with each other. And this isn't just the UK. This is the state that the entire petroleum industry finds itself in. And I don't exclude myself from that. Um, now, the one thing uh, um, that you know about cognitive dissonance that we're told by psychiatrists is that you can maintain this state if you've got an agile mind for some while, but eventually something's got to give. And I think that's my central message today. Something really does have to give. So let's have a look at the state of the petroleum industry right now. And what you should be seeing, hopefully now, is a graph that shows Brent oil price um, normalized over the last um, 50 years or so. And many of you will be familiar with these kind of charts, the, car, the oil price basically going up and down according to economic trends and of course according to geopolitical factors. Um, right now, of course, we're in one of the lowest price regimes we've ever seen in the entire history of the oil industry. And um, people think this is so extraordinary that they call it a black swan event. That means an unprecedented event. But in fact, it's not just one black swan, it's a whole fleet of them. Um, and of course, those factors that are influencing the price of oil right now um, are the competition between the shale industry and OPEC and the coronavirus outbreak and the economic slump that's gone with that. So triple whammy, and um, the net result of all of that is that the world is currently awash with cheap oil. Now, that's true, but it basically disguises a different reality if you look underneath the surface. This is a rather complicated graph here that shows um, trends in oil supply over the last century, a little over, more than a century. And these block colors here, the green color and the gray color, they're basically showing how much oil has been found at any particular time. And you can see there that the good old glory days in the 60s, 70s and 80s, we were finding huge amounts of oil and discovering new provinces and opening them up. 
Um, and that's flattened out to something like a constant and much lower level and perhaps even a diminishing level over the last 20 years or so. But while that's been happening, strangely, the success rate of drilling exploration wells has gone up. This is the magenta curve here. So we, showing that success rate has gone up and up and that's basically a function of better technology. And we've been taking fewer wells to do it. So the number of wells that have actually been drilled has gone down. So as we get cleverer and cleverer, we're finding less and less oil. Why is that? And the answer is because, and I hope you can see my cursor here, um, we're opportunity constrained. The new provinces are just not there. Let me illustrate that to you. So here's a map showing the main resource contributing basins in the last two decades. That's all the areas where the big oil has been found. And that's shown by the pinkish magenta ellipses on this, this map here. And on the surface, it's pretty good. Look at all these provinces where we've found big oil. Except that if we then look at the provinces that were already established provinces at the time the oil was found, and that's the red stars there, we can see that that doesn't leave many. We can talk about the discoveries in Guiana. We can talk about the discoveries in the Brazil pre-salt. We can talk about West Africa and so on. But that's not a lot in 20 years considering global demand. So to uh, probably misquote a phrase that I heard recently, um, the idea of oil growth by frontier exploration by new geographies is broken on a global scale. What's the net result of that? Well, the net result is if we make projections forward 30 years to 2050, um, we can see um, on this left-hand graph, legacy oil supply in blue, legacy gas supply in red here, um, from existing fields and existing provinces, gradually diminishing through that period, depleting as you would expect. At the same time, global demand is by most projections increasing. These um, um, shaded in areas here represent global demand. And they represent demand for a wide range of scenarios. So, um, so you can see here the range in estimates for a global oil demand range. But the big point about this is that in every single scenario, there is a gap. There's a gap in supply. And of course, that gap is largely driven not by the Western world, but by the demands of the developing countries who want a share of the pie that we've enjoyed for so long. So uh, a big gap in all scenarios, and we're still just talking about petroleum here. I know you're thinking, well, we can fill that gap by renewables, but let's stick with petroleum for a while. So can we fill the gap with unconventionals, perhaps? Here's a very nice map from Accenture, which basically looks at um, the probable unconventional resources, that is from shale um, and tight rocks, oil and gas produced by unconventional methods, including fracking. Okay, so what this shows, of course, is the, in these green dots here on the left, which is the American shale industry, which is where the vast majority of the production is coming from right now. Right now it's heavily depressed, of course, because of the, um, uh, the, the, the very low price and the very high break in them they have. But in any case, this industry is currently coming to its plateau level. Um, the rest of the world, I've often heard say that um, the geology isn't right. America has unique geology. My observation is that that's not true. America doesn't have unique geology. It has a unique commercial regime. There are some forays into um, unconventionals in other parts of the world. The Neoquen Basin in Argentina is a case that particularly stands out. In the Ordos Basin in China, they're producing basin-centered gas from tight rocks using unconventional methods. And there have been some forays into unconventionals in Arctic Russia and the Siberias and the Urals, Foreland and so on. Um, and then possibly if we look at the uh, at North Africa and the Middle East, um, we could have very, very large unconventional reserves, reserves that haven't really been touched. However, it's not the same as in the US. As I said, the difference is in the commercial and the political regime. 
tax and fiscal systems and political factors mean that the progress um, in the rest of the world is slow and is likely to remain slow for some time. Okay, um, but what about that conventional oil that I mentioned earlier, those conventional oil reserves? What, what about the reserves that we've got left? So here's two nice maps that actually show uh, not potential reserves, but actual discovered reserves worldwide. They might be a little out of date, but they make their main point. On the left-hand side, we've got oil. On the right-hand side, we've got red. And the block colors here, the green on the left and the red on the right, represent the remaining reserves. Now, it's pretty easy to see from this that if we look at remaining reserves in the world, the first thing is there's quite a lot of them. And the second is that they're almost heavily uh, concentrated here in the Middle East and here in Russia. So if you look at this, you could well imagine, and as many pundits have said, actually, we can supply the oil uh, and, and gas that the world needs until 2050 if we really want to. We could probably plug the gap by just pumping very, very hard from these areas. But of course, that would mean that uh, basically the entire energy supply of the world, the vast majority of it would devolve to two places, to the Middle East and to Russia. And we have to ask if that's a, a desirable situation. But um, on the face of it, we could actually fill the gap just by sucking really hard at the reserves that we've got. But do, do we actually want to? Well, I'm not going to spend a lot of time apologizing for the uh, petroleum industry here. But right now, of course, the situation is that most people don't want what the petroleum industry has got to offer. They would like to get away from it somehow. But perhaps we should take a little pause to remember what the petroleum industry has brought us. These are some nice graphs from Hans Rosling's excellent book, Factfulness, where a global um, statistical database has been compiled. And these are just some worldwide factors. So we can see in the last hundred years or so, we've had a significant drop in child mortality. We've had a significant drop in extreme poverty. Um, life expectancy has gone up literacy has gone up, and there are numerous graphs like this to show that uh, human well-being has improved considerably over the last hundred years. There are still lots and lots of problems, as we know, but things aren't actually getting worse, they're getting better. And of course, this is all of these big changes take place over the last hundred years or so, which corresponds to the industrial age, and the industrial age is largely driven uh, by oil and gas. So, as I say, um, I won't spend a lot of time apologizing for the petroleum industry, but we have to accept the fact that all of these changes come as a price. And of course, this is the price. Um, world energy consumption almost exactly matching those previous changes there has uh, rocketed over the last hundred years, as I'm sure you know, and is still increasing today. And what's most important, I suppose, is this red arrow here which basically shows the proportion of that energy consumption that is, um, that, that is provided by fossil fuels, coal, oil, and natural gas. Um, and with that fossil fuel, of course, comes carbon dioxide, and with the carbon dioxide comes temperature increase. Now, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time today talking about the pros and cons of global warming. The global warming debate is often portrayed in some sectors of the public as being um, simply a matter of opinion. Um, on the one side, there are the people that think that uh, anthropogenic climate change is real. On the other hand, there are people that say that now there's no climate change at all, or if it's happening, it's not caused by carbon dioxide. And in some sectors of the public, those ideas are just uh, portrayed as equal and opposite theories. Choose which one you believe. Well, I think it's our job as scientists to say that that's not the case. These theories are not equal and opposite. On the one side, there are a few noisy lobbyists and uh, admittedly very powerful uh, politicians. On the other side, there are the, is the work of thousands of scientists and enough scientific reports probably to fill this room that I'm sitting in right now. So they're not equal and opposite theories any more than the globular earth versus the flat earth are equal and opposite theories. 
So you'll hear, for example, that while global warming isn't real, I don't actually think it's taking place. So if that happens as scientists, I think it's your job to point out that um, virtually every um, independent agency that's measured uh, uh, temperature shows that temperature is increasing. And this is several different agencies on this plot here that shows the rapid increase over the last 20, 30 years or so. And the most important of the lines that's shown here by far is the black one, because that was a lobby group, uh, temperatures measured by a lobby group that was basically set up to debunk climate change, but even they couldn't ignore their data. As geologists, we often hear this one. Well, it's not um, carbon dioxide causing temperature, it's temperature causing carbon dioxide. And people point to the, um, the glacial periods, and we're crossing that we're in the glacial period now. They point to the glaciations and the interglacial, uh, interglacials and say, look at this, uh, carbon dioxide is increasing during the warm period and decreasing during the cold period. Well, of course, that's true. And by the way, this is, uh, these are temperatures, and these are uh, carbon dioxide levels measured from Antarctic ice core data. Uh, this, is, uh, this is true. Um, as you warm up the sea, carbon dioxide is liberated. No argument there. But the fact that you can't escape is that for 60, 600,000 years, atmospheric carbon dioxide has never been above this red line. The current level is right there, way in uh, uh, way above any previous level in the interglacials. And as geologists, this is the one that we often hear the most, but don't you guys say that there have been um, very extreme uh, paleoclimates in the past? This is nothing, is it? What are we experiencing now compared to the past? Um, and of course, that's true as well. Um, this, this is a chart here that shows on the left hand side, atmospheric carbon dioxide over the last 60 million years. These are of course measured by proxies, isotopes and so on. Um, and on the right hand side, the global temperatures cooling to its present position. And of course, what this shows is that um, back 55 million years ago in the Paleocene Eocene thermal maximum, the earth was an absolute inferno and carbon dioxide levels were, were sky high. Um, so yes, there were extreme changes in climate in the past, but those changes in climate also coincided with mass extinctions. Um, the human race evolved during this last period, during the last million years or so, during the cool glacial and interglacial uh, periods um, in lowland areas close to the coast. They couldn't possibly have evolved or even survived back here in the early Eocene when temperatures were so high and carbon dioxide was so high. So when you uh, hear this phrase, save the planet, which is not my favorite phrase, um, as geologists, I think we know that the planet's gonna be okay. The planet's gonna be fine. It's not saving the planet we're talking about, it's actually saving ourselves. We might not be okay. And this is uh, climatologist Dan Britt posing the big question. Do you like sea level where it is? Because, you know, if the present ice sheets melt, this is what the coastline of the eastern seaboard of the US will look like. It's not about saving the planet, it's about saving us. Okay, so the rest of this talk is going to be about how, how we can predict this and what we can do about it. So, Let's start that by having a look at some trends in the energy world. And this is um, a graph produced by Equinor from their energy perspectives report, which they've kindly allowed me to use for public presentation. Now, on the, in the blue colors, on the left-hand side of this graph, we can see some of the good energy trends that are happening right now. For example, booming electrovoltaic sales, record solar and wind capacity, and so on. On the right-hand side, we can see some of the bad things that are happening right now. Carbon dioxide is still going up. US-China trade tensions, coal demand still going up and coal usage still going up. You put all of these many competing factors together, 
you can, if you like, regard it as devolving into three possible scenarios. So on the left hand side in blue, the renewal scenario. In that particular case, uh, we, um, we cooperate as a human race, countries cooperate. The energy transition happens fast and we strive to meet the two degree target set by the Paris Agreement. That's the renewal scenario. Reform scenario is more or less carrying on as is. We're trying to make some reforms. We're doing the best we can, but we're still largely market and technology driven. And some people say that this scenario is already verging on the right hand scenario, rivalry, which is basically every man for himself. Geopolitical volatility, boom and bust, destructive market rule, and nobody cooperating. And the effects, of course, of those different scenarios are, are very different. So there's a rather complicated graph, again, from uh, Equinor Energy Perspectives, that shows on the left-hand side the percentage of world energy demand by fuel stuffs. And the greenish colors here are basically the energy sources associated um, with renewables. And the dark gray and black colors here are energy from fossil fuels and the percentage of the total world energy budget. So you can see here that in the renewal scenario, we've significantly decreased the amount of fossil fuel usage by 2050. But I think what's equally significant there is it's not been eliminated entirely. And, but even renewables are coming in and taking a significant part of the supply. On the other extreme, the rivalry scenario here, um, it, w life is still dominated by fossil fuels. This is the pump hard scenario I talked about earlier on, and renewables are still very much taking a back seat. And what will the effect of that be on atmospheric carbon dioxide? Well, that's pretty obvious. In the case of the rivalry scenario, it keeps on going up. And in the reform scenario where we are at the moment, it hardly changes, it goes up and perhaps stays more or less where it is. Only the renewal scenario actually drops the carbon dioxide levels enough to actually um, have any hope whatsoever of meeting the Paris Agreement. Now there's a problem with extrapolating trends. When you extrapolate trends forward into the future, it's a little bit like driving using your rear view mirror you can't really see the obstacles ahead and you can't see the big changes ahead. And here's a wonderful example of extrapolating trends, the great horse manure crisis of 1894, when pundits said, in 50 years, every street in London will be buried under nine feet of horse manure. And, and the experts got together even at the end of the 19th century and they, um, they, couldn't, find, they couldn't find an answer to this problem. No answer was found, and yes, we know that by the early 20th century, things had changed radically, and, uh, and there were hardly any horses to be seen on the roads. So basically, a step change has happened that just could not have been forecast or was not forecast by many people. And when we come back to the petroleum industry, we ask ourselves, what could these step changes be that could really change things? Well, it could be a technological advance in, um, in uh, harnessing renewable energy, for example. And then on the negative side, it could be factors that reduce the population. And I remember when I first presented this slide about two years ago, I said, um, the unthinkable, of course, is, um, is war or pandemic, which would reduce demand. Well, that was two years ago, and here we are right now. Um, the coronavirus outbreak has had a fairly significant effect on, on world energy demand. At the top right here, you can see carbon dioxide emissions, and you can say that, see there's been a significant dip um, in 2020 as a result of the, of the lowering of energy usage. And then on the bottom left-hand side here, we can see projected percentage change in energy demand relative to 2019. And we can see that almost all forms of energy supply and particularly non-renewables are down. And interestingly, renewables is, is still up a little bit. 
Now, is this just a blip? Is this just a temporary thing? And, and, uh, and as soon as the coronavirus pandemic is under control, will it all go back to normal? Perhaps, but I actually don't think so. I think that the psychic shock that's been produced by the coronavirus outbreak will change our attitudes. It will change our attitudes to energy usage. Right now, we're sitting here, 132 people that could have traveled to this conference and sat in a room and, uh, and created a fairly large carbon footprint as a result of that. We're doing it differently. And I think the world may rethink its energy usage as a result of this. Plus, of course, we don't yet know that this problem is over. So is this the beginning of a step change? Maybe. But let's get back to technical, um, technological step changes. And here's a nice quote for you from William Nordhaus, who was the uh, winner of the Nobel Prize in Economics in 2018. And I like this one. People think protecting the environment will be so hard that they want to ignore the problem and pretend it doesn't exist. But humans are capable of amazing accomplishments if we set our minds to it. And you know what? I really think that we are. Here's a very celebrated example. Remember the ozone hole? This was dominating people's thoughts towards the end of the 80s when it was realized that ozone was depleting, probably due to chlorofluorocarbons in the upper stratosphere. Well, in this particular case, there was cooperation. Countries got together and in the Montreal Protocol, they banned CFCs and uh, ozone levels stabilized by the mid 1990s and it looks like they're now on the road to recovery. So this is the kind of thing that we can do if we cooperate and if we try. But today, mostly in this room, we're scientists and engineers. So what can we uh, particularly contribute? Well, here's another nice quote from Dan Frey. The world is overrun by cheap and plentiful clean energy. So how do we adapt? Interesting. So what does this guy mean by overrun by cheap and, and plentiful clean energy? Let's take a look. This is a graph here that basically shows it wasn't prepared by me, but I think it's a good one um, to illustrate my point. Um, global energy potential. On the right hand side, we've got the total global reserve. On the left hand side, we've got the energy available every year. So you can see the total reserve here uh, with coal dominating as a big black ominous blob um, and the other uh, agents such as uranium, oil, natural gas and so on. Um, on the left hand side, we can see some of the renewables and how much they can supply per year. And this is world consumption, this grayish globe in the middle. But the item that dominates this whole chart is this big yellow one here, which is solar. Basically, there's enough solar energy beating down on the earth every day to supply our consumption a thousand times over. The problem is, of course, it's beating down on places where we can't necessarily use it. The key is not availability, but it's harnessing and storage and then transport, because as we know, electricity isn't that easy a thing to transport over long distances. Um, but there are some positive signs. Cost of solar is one three hundredth what it was 40 years ago. And even 20 years ago, I was saying we'd have to cover the entire UK with solar panels in order to equal one power station and how that efficiency has changed. So what's this got to do with geoscientists, you might ask? How can geoscientists contribute to this? Well, for a start, we can, um, we can find critical minerals for battery storage and we can help in this process. Some of the critical minerals are lithium, cobalt, graphite, uh, right now, and of course the rare earths are also very important. And this is just a, a map showing some of the locations worldwide where deposits of these critical minerals uh, for energy storage are found. However, finding them is one thing, but with critical minerals, it doesn't just come down to finding them, it comes down to factors such as uh, production and refining 
and, uh, and processing. Here are some maps for lithium and graphite that show uh, um, the areas which are the main producers and the areas in which the deposits are found. And the block colors here show the areas that are the main uh, producers. Um, what this of course shows is that China is a dominant force both in production and in terms of processing. Now we know that demand for critical minerals is going to rocket over the next 10 years. It must do as a result of the continuing drive towards energy storage. Um, in fact, there are some people that think just in a few years time, the demand will actually uh, triple. But interestingly, um, right now, and ironically, a bit like oil, the commodity price is currently low. Critical minerals are currently in a slump. But that, I think, again, disguises the future trend, which is going to be increasing need for these products. So geoscientists are going to be needed to find these critical minerals. Um, and uh, as I say, finding them, unfortunately, isn't the only problem. Right now, when we find critical minerals, usually we have to transport them all to the Far East, where they're processed, and then they're sent back to uh, other countries, again, neatly packaged. So while we're busily producing these materials for energy storage, we're using huge amounts of energy just to transport them around the world. This is something that we have to remedy. And then I don't want to finish this without uh, talking a little bit about uh, uh, geothermal systems. Um, this is particularly interesting to geoscientists, I think, because um, well, essentially in geothermal systems, we're using some of the technologies associated with unconventional hydrocarbon exploration, uh, fracking and so on, um, in order to obtain geothermal energy. I'm, talking, I'm thinking in terms of rock properties, I'm thinking in terms of fracture networks, I'm thinking in terms of fluid flow and so on. So research into geothermal should be particularly interesting to us. And here are just three uh, great examples of um, research into enhanced geothermal systems. The Sanford facility in South Dakota, underground research facility, shown here with its huge network of test arrays and wires. The FORGE project in Utah um, is um, another enhanced geothermal project, which is run by the group that I currently work for, um, EGI. And then last but not least, the initiative in Newcastle that Richard mentioned that he was uh, so excited about to, uh, to um, understand geothermal energy and to utilize that geothermal energy in the middle of Newcastle. So I guess my bottom line is, um, there are going to be exciting geoscience career opportunities in the energy transition. Not necessarily the ones that we had before, not necessarily the geoscience opportunities that we understood as the best ones before, but new ones. So as we replace gasoline, petrol, with clean electricity, as we replace oil and coal-fired power stations with solar, wind, and natural gas, new opportunities are going to open up and are opening up. And there's a list of new opportunities here, but from the geoscientific point of view, some of the main ones, of course, are battery storage, critical minerals that I talked about earlier, geothermal, and at the bottom here, carbon capture and storage, which I haven't covered at all in this talk, but is uh, also going to be very important. So that leaves me with some conclusions and takeaways. Number one, conventional exploration is opportunity constrained and unconventionals, that is repeating the UK, US experience uh, worldwide is beset with problems. In most projections, oil and gas resources don't fill the gap in demand until uh, 2050. But even if we were to continue exploring, producing and exploiting at our present pace, Renewables still can't fill the projected supply gap. So on the face of it, that doesn't sound very good, but as I hope I made the point, history shows we've never really been able to forecast step changes. 
step changes can take us completely by surprise and we hope that the step change that we experience will be a, a more efficient means of, of harnessing renewable energy, for example. Anthropogenic climate change is real and accepted by many in the petroleum industry. I think um, some uh, people outside the petroleum industry might think everybody uh, within the industry is a die-hard anti-climate change um, activist. That is not true. Many people within the industry are, are deeply concerned by it too, and their strategies are starting to reflect that in the more progressive companies. Meeting global carbon dioxide and climate targets requires close international cooperation, responsible stewardship of fossil fuel resources, and of course, investment in alternative en alternate energy. This kind of cooperation has happened before. It's not unprecedented, but right now there's a big sense of urgency. Real progress won't come from blame and confrontation. And by blame and confrontation, I mean um, deciding who the clearly defined enemy is and then destroying them. That's not going to get us anywhere. It's going to come from forward looking scientific and engineering solutions. There's more than enough clean energy to power the world, full stop, we know that. But harnessing storage and of course cultural changes are the areas for step changes that we need. Finally, uh, geoscientists have got a vital role in the energy transition. It's going to be new, it's going to be different, but it's also going to be rewarding. And I think that's a good place to stop and uh, I'm hoping that there will be some uh, questions. I'm, I'm leaving uh, 20, 15 minutes to take your questions. I think the modus operandi here is going to be that um, if there are any questions, they have to go in the chat box and that Richard will, um, uh, will summarize any of those that he sees there and I'll try my best to answer them. If I can't answer them today, um, I will get back with a series of uh, more comprehensive answers on email. So thanks. Over to you, Richard. Thanks, Tony. Thanks. Really enjoyed that. And, um, you know, I've been out of the oil industry for 17 years, so it's good to hear a more up-to-date view of things. But I've got the first questions come in. Um, do encourage anyone else who's got current questions to ping them, put them, put them out there to everyone, and I'll, I'll read them off. But the first one is a pretty critical one. It's from Mark, Mark Island. Um, you know, the, the traditional big oil companies, what well, energy companies, Shell, B, BP, Total, etc. Um, will they survive the transition? And what do you think they may look like on the other side? I think the, uh, well, okay. Uh, to start that, um, a lot of companies are not going to survive the transition. They're not even su uh, surviving what's happening right now. During the coronavirus um, outbreak, I've seen three or four companies go to the wall, essentially file for bankruptcy already. So smaller companies, it's basically carnage. Um, uh, the larger companies, I think, will adapt. And I think the more progressive ones see the writing on the wall. And if you look at their strategies, you'll see that they, are, they have a agenda to transition to becoming energy companies. So the more sensible amongst those companies will actually um, will actually try to transition to being energy companies. What they've got to be uh, aware of is that people will claim what they're doing right now is greenwashing. In other words, you, 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 you're buying a few windmills and then you're saying that you're an environmental sensitive company, but you're still pumping oil and gas. I think societal pressure and societal trends is going to um, uh, make it so that they, they, they have to basically go the whole way and they have to um, start becoming energy companies and they have to bring in a situation where the vast majority of their energy is produced from, from renewables. I think the top companies, the big companies, will accomplish that. Um, as for the, the smaller companies, I don't know. Perhaps new companies will come up and fill the void. Yeah, so you, and thanks, and also you've covered a question I was going to ask, but in that universities are um, raining through the pressure of student bodies uh, looking to disinvest, and whether you think that has, a, has had any influence at all. 
Um, yeah, I, I personally um, don't think it's uh, had much effect on the petroleum industry. Divesting from the from oil industry shares will make almost no difference to the petroleum industry itself, except as some kind of moral blow. Um, uh, you can also very easily expose the hypocrisy of that position. That you know, okay. It's nice that you've got a clearly defined enemy now. Now you can uh, drive home in your car and you can um, go on your package holiday uh, courtesy of cheap airfares. Um, but I don't think that's necessarily a, a, a good argument to make. But my main point is that uh, I think the one, the one I make here on this series of bullets, um, this defining the petroleum industries as the enemy and trying and punishing them for it is not actually going to uh, accomplish very much particularly when many people within those companies themselves sincerely want to make a change but you're not going to allow them to make a change by turning them into the enemy so, so I, I say get them on your side i say and i and i also believe that divestment is essentially ineffective yeah, okay, no, that's a good one, and keep them in the room, so because we're all on this journey together. There's a great question that's come in from Connor O'Sullivan. Um, first, he says, great talk, Tony. Well, agreed. Um, do you think university geoscience degrees are adapting fast enough to equip young geoscientists for the new energy sector? How can we do, how can we do better? Um, yeah, well, I, 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 I think that might be true. Remember that I, I'm associated with academia, but I'm not in academia, so I can't really comment on the financing, the politics and the culture uh, within a a academia right now. But I think yes, and I think um, more emphasis on the, um, on the use of geoscience within the energy transition. I've just touched on a few areas today. I could give a talk just on um, carbon capture and storage just on geothermal, just on critical minerals. Um, so imagine that instead of a sort of an MSc in, um, in petroleum geoscience, nothing wrong with those. What about a, um, a, 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 an MSc course on, um, on geoscience applications to the energy transition? So I think, yes, there's things the universities can do, and I actually see that coming, yeah. Yeah, no, and I, I think uh, Durham University did an interesting article in the Times Higher Education uh, magazine where they were saying the numbers of students who want to do geology is dropping. And one of the reasons is that, you know, we need to adapt and teach the disciplines that are actually going to help us get out of the hole we're in, in terms of what you've been talking about. Yeah, this is, um, this, this is uh, the main uh, mission that Edith Wilson of the Rock Whisperer that helped with this talk has. She goes around telling any university department uh, that, hey, there is a role for you here. It's a different role. Um, you need to rethink um, uh, uh, what you're doing in the future, but don't think that there's not a role for the geosciences there are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, great. So another question, but I think I sort of know that you've already said, there's one question on carbon capture and storage, but you said you, you do think that has a role in the future. So that could be a yes, no. I think it's a yes. I think it's a yes. The question is, can we do enough of it? I mean, you know as well as I do that there's been some great initiatives on carbon capture and storage, including in the North Sea, uh, uh, and including by my previous company, Equinor, which, I, which we were quite proud of. But it's a drop in the bucket. The question is, can we, can we actually capture and store um, enough? Now, of course, in, um, in the UK, there was a major initiative for carbon sequestration in some of the offshore fields. Uh, and, and, you know, it had a billion dollar budget and it was incredibly promising. But um, in their wisdom, the government chopped that about three years ago and all of that money was withdrawn, which is, I think is a black mark against our name. Yeah, yeah, yeah. OK, the, the questions, are, there's more questions than we can deal with, which is, is a good problem to have. Um, and we, we thought that might be the case. Um, what what makes you think we won't go back to business as usual after this pandemic's over in terms of carbon footprint? There's lots of people that think that we will, and um, and, and it's it's possible that we that uh, just as soon as this happens, everybody starts hopping on the plane um, at, uh, at at the drop of a hat. Oh, I think I'll go and see my relatives. So I think I think I'll spend the weekend in Spain. 
or I'll, and there's a really nice conference um, in the other side of the world. I really need to go to that. Um, uh, you know, all of these, uh, all of these things could happen. Um, but as I say, I don't think the, uh, even if, even if it does bounce back, I don't think we should underestimate what, what I called the psychic shock. That is to say, the change in people's way of thinking. I don't know about the rest of you, but certainly I've revised my attitude to travel and to other energy usage as a result of the coronavirus outbreak. Now, whether that's reflected worldwide, I don't know. The other thing, and of course, this isn't a medical talk by any means, but uh, what I'm told is that there's a, there's a possibility that the problem doesn't end here. And if it doesn't end here and there's another pandemic, how many will it take for us to realize that we can do things a different way, just like we're doing this conference a different way? Yeah, okay. I mean, a good question on rare earths coming from Onos. As the exploration for metals and rare earths increases to meet the demand for batteries in the future, will this not equally be very damaging for the environment, given that we are now even thinking of going into deep sea mining? Do you know what? I think that's, that's, that's a, a very key question. Nothing comes for free, does it? Um, you, you, so, yes, we can, um, perhaps we can store electricity incredibly efficiently. Perhaps we can exploit rare earths um, uh, and um, from different environments. Um, but everything comes at a price. This is, this, is, this, is the, the, this is essentially the price of progress. So I don't have an answer to this. I think you've raised a very significant problem, but let's not um, uh, go through the energy transition and then at the end of it, uh, you know, pat ourselves in the back and say, well, we've really reduced uh, fossil fuels, but oh, we've got this different problem now and it's equally damaging. So yeah, great point. Okay, thanks. I mean, this is a, a good one around developing countries. I'm not sure if I completely understand the way the question's been written, but you know, developing countries need cheap, affordable energy. And if fossil fuels is cheap, isn't there a sort of obligation on us who benefited from them to complete continue to supply them? Um, I don't blame developing countries at all for wanting uh, what the rest of the world has had for. 50 plus years um it's um and and i see that as the as, as as a critical problem i don't have an answer to it um i, I just hope that that awareness changes because um because you know you you can't blame people for actually want it, wanting that you can't blame them for wanting to participate in what in and what we've enjoyed um as I say, it's, uh, it's, it's essentially uh, uh, coming down to an awareness thing, I think, Richard. Yeah, yeah, no, I ag agreed. And, um, you know, I, I guess the UK government's putting £1.5 billion pounds into, into uh, research that impacts uh, low and middle income countries. It's uh, through what's called the Global Challenge Research Fund. And that's where we can help, um, and not in a sort of, in an imperialistic way, but contribute to making technology jumps so that um, India doesn't, or countries, parts of Africa don't necessarily develop the same national grid system that now is a bit of a weight and anchor around our necks in the United Kingdom. So a bit like mobile telephones, um, you don't have to have British Telecom and all the wires if, we, if there's a technology jump we can help with. So uh, fantastic opportunities. Um, no, this is true. And then, of course, in some of the developed, uh, under, sorry, undeveloped countries, and in particular Africa, there's an abundant supply of, uh, of solar energy. Um, but not, um, and uh, we've been talking about how we can get that energy and transport it to, so that we can benefit from it. But what about them benefiting from it? Well, of course, uh, in Africa and in the parts of the world, there's been experimentation with uh, essentially off-grid solar energy. So yeah. you don't rely on the grid and the connections and all of the wires and all of the sort of wastage that goes with that, but you essentially use off-grid supply. Yeah. I think that the world will move towards off-grid supply, just as it'll move towards um, uh, forms of transport that are not personally owned, but are, um, are, are available on contract. So I think we'll move from the car generation into the Uber generation very quickly. Okay, oh, there's still some, some questions, so I'm going to try and punch through them. Um, 
Okay, go on here. You know, the shale gas has sort of failed in the UK, partly because of the nervousness about what goes on underground from members of the public. Do you think that's going to get in the way of the intelligent use of intelligent use of the subsurface for, say, hydrogen storage or CO2 storage? This, the fact that, you know, we found that, you know, the conversation wasn't great for shale, uh, the communication wasn't good, etc. Is that going to get, is that going to happen again? Yes, it's interesting, isn't it? What was, what was it that really bothered people about fracking? Was it the fact that you could cause earthquakes and your chimney pot would fall off? Um, was it due to the fact that it was going to cause a lot of disruption with all those trucks coming, rolling down your street? Or was it because it was about oil and gas potentially leaking into your, uh, into your reservoirs? I have a feeling that the, the public will be more acceptable um, if this, these kind of techniques are used for something that can be seen as part of the energy transition, that can be used for clean energy storage, that can be used for geothermal and so on. I don't know that that's the case. Um, you know, as in uh, many of the things that you've heard today, it's my opinion, but I think that they will be more kindly disposed towards, uh, towards that. I don't know which of those factors is really the one that people object to the most, but I think it might be because it's the big bad oil industry. Okay. All right. So we've got, we're going to have to close it out, but, um, can I ask one a, a profound question? If you had a younger view, a younger you, if you were going back to where you were, and many people on this call are perhaps in, in, in the beginnings of their career. What, what would you, well, how would you be going about being that, you know, finding that right career, that right path? What would you be saying to yourself about the future and how you would adjust to it? Well, um, you know, so you've asked me to speak personally here and, um, I, and so I can only really speak personally. I can't put myself into the mind of a younger person today. So I can say that I went into geology basically because I love geology um, and, uh, and that's why I did my first degree and that's why I did my PhD. And then I, could, I had to find a job and it was a matter of what jobs were available. I didn't set out to think I'm going to be an oil company geologist. So if I was uh, actually in that sort of position today, uh, well, first of all, uh, we have to accept the fact that uh, I might not have had a choice, just as I uh, didn't have much choice about what to do after I, left, um, after I left, left college. If I did have a choice, I think right now my choice would be to work in geothermal because I just find the, the, uh, the multidisciplinary approach, I find the sort of uh, the rock physics, I find the, uh, the, the geological um, issues are, uh, are, are incredibly fascinating. I don't know whether that's going to be, be a big employer. Critical minerals certainly will be. We will have to see. But if, if I was, uh, I wouldn't have any problem whatsoever as a geologist going forward into one of the, the fields that I've outlined today. I've enjoyed being a petroleum geologist. It's been, um, it's been a, a, a productive and, and enjoyable career. Um, but I don't think I would have any problem with some of the geological disciplines associated with the energy transition. Fantastic. So, I mean, uh, there's a great point that the skills that people need, you know, what we need to know about the subsurface in terms of oil and gas, a very similar set of questions for storing hydrogen safely or recovering geothermal energy, understanding fluid flow and how rocks will behave. So there's fantastic compliments coming in on, on, a, on a great um, presentation. There's quite a few questions we've not get, got time to go through around um, will nuclear have an important role to play and what about uh, emerging producing countries in Africa but what I suggest we'll do Tony if you're okay with it is respond to those people after the after the end of the after, after in over the next coming days and I just wanted to thank you on behalf of everyone at Newcastle University and everyone on the call for a very very interesting and thought-provoking presentation. Thank you very much, and I'll try to answer your questions over the next uh, few weeks. Thanks, Tony. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye.